Um, so I know a lot of you were at AbGradCon last year, and a lot of you weren't. Anyone who wasn't, um, my name's Alyssa. I work with Ralph Pudritz, who's the director of the Origins Institute at McMaster University. And he started this institute specifically to look at the origins of life um, on planets and origins of stars in the universe and origins of stellar systems, all things. Sorry, thank you. We're going to go away. OK. Um, so it's a really big deal just in terms of origins of life. So my work specifically has to do with seeding life on exoplanets. So I look um, mostly at amino acid uh, concentrations on meteorites and how those might be produced within meteoritic parent bodies and then transferred to exoplanets via these meteoritic impacts. Um, I did not include a plot of what I did last year. Um, I will des describe it in just a second, just for, for background knowledge. So anyway, the point of what I do, um, I'm looking at the synthesis of the amino acids in the parent bodies, meteoritic parent bodies. Um, I look at the concentrations and study the theory behind how those um, amino acids got there. And the whole point of why we even started doing this research is because we know that there are biomolecules present in meteorites. And that you know, when we go to Antarctica or wherever and pick up those meteorites, we have all the biomolecules in them. But there are also, I mean, there's evidence for some of those amino acids being extraterrestrial in origin. So it's not that they're terrestrial contamination. They really were created in space and brought to Earth via these meteorites. Um, and again, this is just the theory for how life um, starts on planets. So the big picture of what I'm trying to do um, is actually model the synthesis. So I'm using some theoretical amino acid synthesis equations and being like, look, let's use a computer. And if we put in this amino acid equation, let's see if we can match the amino acid concentrations that we see in observed meteorites that we pick up off the ground. Um, so the first part of my project, which is what I was doing last year, was just trying to find all of the meteorit meteoritic abundance data, because there's a lot of it out there. I mean, we've known for ages that there are amino acids in these meteorites that there's a lot of data to collate to be able to, to verify that when I'm modeling my amino acid abundances, I'm actually matching what we're really seeing. So the second, second part, which is what I've started just recently, is actually doing the modeling. So now I have something to aim for. I have my concentrations that I know. And now I'm changing the dials on my model to try to recreate those abundances that we get out. Um, I wish I had brought it. Yeah, I didn't bring it. Um, so last year, what I was doing was looking at how the concentrations of these amino acids change with Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy is just a measure of how, how spontaneous the reaction is. It's how much the reaction wants to occur. And what happened last year, pretend on this screen that I have a, um, just like a, an exponential decrease on a graph. And this side is concentration of amino acid. And this side is Gibbs free energy, increasing Gibbs free energy. And the relationship that I got out of my data last year was that you have more amino acids being created with an increase in Gibbs free energy, which is exactly the pattern that we would expect to see. But now, given that relationship, I've come back through all my data. Um, oh, I was going to talk about meteorites. I kind of just skipped a slide. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Um, meteorites, which have been mentioned, um, there's a whole lot of meteorites. I don't look at most of them. About 4% of meteorite falls are something called um, these carbonaceous chondrites that I look at. That's this green column here on the left. And these, the CM, CI, CR, CVs, also the COs. And working on new data, the, the CBs um, have an extremely high content of, for all meteorites, they have an extremely high content of biomolecules and of water. So these are really the meteorite classes that we want to look at when we're looking for amino acids. And in addition to these letters, which describe the different uh, meteorite types, they also fall in, into a petrologic class. And this, um, this, the chart down here on the bottom, just tells you roughly how altered these meteorites are. So in the temperature range, which I look at, is between about 150 and 200 degrees C, which is right in here. And that corresponds to the meteorite classes, mostly CM and C2. So I tend to stay within the CM, C2 class of meteorites. This goes back to the data. So this is what I have spent an entire year doing. Um, no one likes looking at tables. I have a table that takes 12 pages to print, just full of amino acid abundance data. Didn't want to show you that. So instead, here's at least a graph with colors on it. Um, these are just the CM meteorites. Everything along the x-axis is a different uh, sample of meteorite. And along the y-axis is just concentration. So that's parts per billion of amino acid in whatever meteorite. And then all the different lines are the different amino acid types. 
So generically, glycine is one of the uh, most common and easiest to form amino acids that we see. Um, so it's this dark blue line that's mostly towards the top, and then you get some variation. But in general, kind of the, the pattern to see from the CMs is that you have fairly high concentrations in here. You know, you have 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4 concentrations of all these amino acids. As opposed to something <laughs> like this, we have fewer, fewer CI meteorites, but you know, now we're down you know, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 2 range for the CI type meteorites. COs, again, decreasing a little bit more. Um, CRs are interesting. Classically, CMs are supposed to be the meteorites that have the, the greatest biomolecule concentrations in there, but there are a couple of exceptions, and those exceptions all are within the CR class of meteorites. You see these guys, these guys here have up into the 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 parts per billion concentrations of amino acids. And that doesn't mean anything, well, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. It means stuff on its own, not to me. <laughs> it's important to me because that means when I try to do my modeling, I can't just match something according to an order of magnitude now. I have to, it gets into variation you know, over multiple orders of magnitude, which is just hard to do computationally. Oh, and CVs, more meteorites, lots of meteorites. This is probably, um, this is my baby. This is a year's worth of work in one plot. I don't get pretty pictures like a lot of the, the rest of you do. But anyway, this is total average amino acid concentration. So each different color, each column is a different amino acid, and they've been averaged and totaled over the different meteorite classes and petrologic types. So this is very broken down according to um, the pressure and the temperature involved in making these meteorites. And what you see is exactly what we saw in the earlier pattern. You have the CM2 and the CR2s that had, have orders of magnitude more concentration of amino acids than something like the CIs, you know, the petrologic type ones, and the, the CVs and the COs. So that's just reassuring. Um, after we have that data, what we need to do is convert it, because parts per billion is useful to the observers, um, but when it comes out of my computer, it doesn't happen in parts per billion. I get data that um, doesn't look like that. So this graph is just showing you Specifically, I'm relating all of the concentrations in this graph. I'm now just dividing them by the concentration um, of glycine so that we have a plot relative to glycine in this image. Uh, this is specifically for the CM-type meteorites and this for the CRs. And again, the takeaway message for here is that with some exceptions, you classically have like six or so amino acids that really are the amino acids that stand out for being present in, uh, in meteorites. So you have a lot, of, a lot of glycine, a lot of alanine. Usually we have more serine. Um, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and valine are kind of the main things. Um, it doesn't look like it. I know they're not really exciting pictures, but that was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. So the point is, now I have concentrations and I know what I'm looking for. Um, so now we come back and do this, which is what I'm working on just now. Um, this is done with a program called ChemApp. ChemApp is uh, what is the purpose of ChemApp? ChemApp is a software that minimizes the Gibbs free energy of a system that you input. So I can take ChemApp and I say, hey, I want you to consider all of these reactants. So we use something called Strecker synthesis to model the reaction of, or the, the synthesis of amino acids. So we input HCN and ammonia and water and some aldehydes. And what we hope to get out are relative concentrations of these six amino acids uh, relative to the glycine that match the observed abundances. Um, and you can see that's actually working pretty well. Yay. Um, so, sorry. Observed is in the red on the, the left side of each of these bars. The red is observed abundances of some amino acid. And the green on the right side is simulated. So that's what's coming out of my, of my model. And you can see that easily to within roughly an order of magnitude, I'm actually getting out concentrations that agree with observed values of amino acids for um, for... I totally just lost my train of thought. Sorry. Where it's working. It's working, yay, is the point. Um, so matching, matching amino acid abundances. Yay, and I'm done, and I'm actually on time. Um, Ralph, my supervisor, undergraduate help, Darren, yay. Thanks. I'm done. Good. <laughs> Over here. Sure. Just a quick one. Um, why are you normalizing it to, gl like, why glycine? Um, I couldn't give you an exact answer because classically people who have looked at amino acids on meteorites normalize everything to glycine. It's just kind of, 
yeah, it's just people have done that for as long as I... Like standard mean ocean water tip? Like, yeah. Okay. That's just what... Um, convention is the word that I want. It's just convention by now. Good question, though. I wondered the same thing. I never found out. Convention. Uh, if I could, I'd like to add to that comment. Um, normalization to glycine occurs because it's the simplest amino acid, okay. so it makes sense to normalize to the one that's easiest to make. Um, I have a question about um, your Strecker synthesis sure. simulation. So I want to make sure I didn't misinterpret what you said. Did you say that you put aldehydes into your Strecker model synthesis? Yes, we do. That should be formed by the Strecker synthesis. Yes, we are only considering Strecker synthesis that begins with the aldehydes. We are not doing formation of aldehydes in our model because it gets too complicated. We have too many variables if we include everything that also is needed to make the aldehydes. But because we have detected aldehydes in comets and meteorites and stuff like this, we're assuming that they're there. So in our model, it is very much assuming an, a necessary amount of, of aldehydes that are already in the system. These are the amino acids we would produce. Okay, so you're considering Strecker synthesis starting from the aldehyde? Yes. But Strecker synthesis makes the aldehyde, Strecker right? synthesis makes the amino acids. Right, so the, the aldehydes form first, then that's protonated and you get the amino acid. Yes. But the aldehyde is formed with, in the presence of ammonia and HCN, like you mentioned. Yes. So that's the precursor that's formed during Strecker synthesis. Yes. So are you, you're simulating the latter half of yes. the Strecker, so not the entire Strecker synthesis process. No, we're not doing formation of aldehydes. We're saying given aldehydes, because once you have an aldehyde, you react again with the HCN and the ammonia and the other things, and what comes out the far end is an amino acid. That's, it's very, I mean, no one's ever done this before, and you, I can't include all the parameters in this model right off the bat. It's impossible. So we're, for now, looking specifically at amino acid concentrations and trying to recreate those, not the aldehydes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so also in your synthetic model, mm -hmm. you're only using like a normal, um, well, aldehydes and those sort of things. Do you have any of the exotic charge species that you see in dust grain formations or the meteorites to take into account some of those? Or is it just the basic striker synthesis model? It's again, mostly basic because this research is so new. We have um, another summer student right now who's looking at ketones and carboxylic acids and we're trying to get other data outside of just the meteorites that we have. But for my project, which because no one's done this before, it's very much limited to this set of meteorites and just like half a dozen aldehydes. All right, thank so, you. Yeah, it's, it, both of your points are very valid and that's future work that we would like to do. It's just because we haven't had, had a chance yet. Hi, Alyssa, thank you. That was a very nice talk. Um, I wanted to comment on the one slide that you showed the different classes of meteorites. Okay. It looked like um, two of the classes that were in the center that had more of the red orangey colors. Oh, go back. Whoa, back. Sorry. He just passed it. Oh, this one. Yes, that one. So CM2 and CR2, it looks like the, the orange and reds are more hydrophobic amino acids. I was wondering if you could comment on the significance of that compared to the other classes. <laughs> Is there one? <laughs> um, I am not a chemist. Um, I'm sure there is. We've had um, some other people that are interested in this work that want to look more at um, some specific chemical behaviors of these amino acids. I can absolutely not comment on that. Sorry. Um, people are looking at you know hydrophobicity and electron stuff stuff and how conductive they are and all these other things and I'm like yeah sure you know they, so they do that. I have no idea. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much. Right, cheers. <laughs>